archivist Bill McNett on President Gerald R. Ford in partnership with the Washtenaw County Historical Society. Uh, there are connections with uh, President Ford and uh, my family that go way back. I uh, was born and raised in West Michigan. Gerald Ford was my congressman, but I probably paid more attention to uh, him and his career there because uh, he and my father had graduated from high school together. And so uh, somebody I was aware of from a very young age, uh, some seemed like a very natural thing when I sort of fell into this job of working with his papers. And uh, I just want to mention also that my uh, son-in-law, Jason Sprague, is here uh, in the front row. Uh, he invited me last year to talk to his Michigan history class at Eastern Michigan. He teaches uh, Michigan history at Eastern Michigan University. And he asked me to come in and talk to his classes about uh, President Ford. And that's what got me started on putting all of this together. I started with a picture of President Ford and his dog, Liberty. And um, again, presidential pets are something that at least, you know, fascinates a lot of, a lot of people. But, uh, when the Fords moved into the White House, they did not have uh, a dog, uh, and the president's uh, daughter Susan and the White House photographer decided that they needed to cor correct this uh, oversight. They had had a uh, number of golden retrievers previously, uh, but uh, so the White House photographer started making some telephone calls. But he was very careful about uh, revealing too much. He didn't say, oh, this is the White House calling. We want one of your dogs or anything like that. Because then, then all of a sudden, it becomes a, a media event. So uh, he, he found uh, David Kennerly, the White House photographer, found out that this uh, uh, retriever had recently given birth to a litter. and. Minneapolis, and he called the kennel owner, said he wanted to buy a puppy for a friend of his. Um, That's fine, the owner said, but what was the name of David's friend? And David said it was a surprise. He wanted to keep the name secret. We don't sell dogs that way, the owner replied. We have to know if the dog is going to a good home. <laughs> uh, the couple is friendly, David said. Uh, they're middle-aged. They live in a white house with a big yard and a fence around it. It's a lovely place. Um, do they own or rent, the owner asked. <laughs> David thought for a few minutes, I guess you might call it public housing. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, one other little story. And for the most part, and there, there was a a uh, member of the staff in the White House who had some experience with the training dogs, and uh, the president had a lot of other things to do, so he left the training to this uh, uh, military person in the staff of the White House. Uh, but uh, at one point, then, the, they bred Liberty, and she was expecting puppies. And uh, so, you know, with the other imminent, we were afraid that uh, Liberty would deliver at night. Uh, so we uh, moved her inside for a short while. She slept on the third floor uh, with the trainer. And then one night, the trainer had to be away, and he left Liberty with, with the Fords. And uh, he said, well, if she wants to go out, she'll come and lick your face. And at 3 o'clock in the morning, she came and President Ford's face. And so he got up and put his robe on, and they went down. You know, uh, I guess the, uh, he 
tech in the elevator wasn't working, so they had to walk down three flights of stairs out onto the lawn, and then he turned around to go back in after she'd done her business, and the door was locked. <laughs> and, you know, the, uh, you, you know, rang for the elevator, the elevator was turned off, you know, just, you know but eventually the Secret Service figured out what was going on and, uh, you know, got them uh, back in and uh, just, again, the sort of behind the scenes stories you don't always get from uh, in the news media. Uh, just some basic background about uh, President Ford. Again, he, it, his name at birth, Leslie Lynch King Jr. Parents separated when he was 16 days old and were divorced six months later. Uh, and then eventually, his uh, mother ended up in Grand Rapids, met Gerald Ford Sr., married him, uh, and they, I think from the beginning, his mother always called him Junior as a nickname. And so this is natural that they began uh, referring to him as Gerald R. Ford Jr., to fit with the nickname and everything. But he really did not meet his birth father until he was in high school or really know all of the story and background of, of what had happened with his parents. And we have here one of his school pictures and then a picture of him with his, his stepfather, Gerald Ford Sr., and uh, three half-brothers. And. Uh, when he grew up, he went in, into scouting. He's still the only uh, president who was an Eagle Scout. And uh, you see him here on, on Mackinac Island. And they still have scout troops on Mackinac Island during the summer months uh, doing flag raisings and things like that up at the fort. Uh, this is a picture that you wouldn't really see anywhere else. Uh, because, you know, it's just a, a group that he belonged to when he was in junior high school. And the only reason I included this one, this is Gerald Ford right here, but right there is my father. <laughs> Again, uh, they were in school together all through uh, junior high and high school. Uh, not in, in the same circles. My father was not an athlete. Uh, wasn't Ford, you know, played football and basketball and uh, track and all the, the whole bit. My father was more in the literary side of things, you know, just the school newspaper and the, the school yearbook and all, you know, uh, creative writing and stuff like that. But they, they, knew each other um, and uh, graduated together in a class of 218 students from Grand Rapids South High School. President Ford was involved in politics even in school. He ran for senior class president and again he's up here third left in the back row and you'll see right above his head here he is signed J.R. Jr. Uh, again, it's a nickname that stuck with him for quite a few years there. Um, he, in, a, in my father's yearbook, there's like about a dozen places he has signed the yearbook. Only once did he actually sign his full name, <laughs> to put it in these pictures, he just, you know, fit in. Uh, some uh, abbreviation, abbreviated version. But the, um, interestingly, oh, and then my father was also on student council. He's down here. But the 
this man right to the uh, right of President Ford there was a uh, man by the name of Bill Schooling. He actually is the one who won the race for class president. President Ford lost. <laughs> uh, but Bill Schooling won uh, as class president. And many years later, he was a banker in Washington, D.C. And at the time when President Ford became president. And President Ford, he was uh, always wanted to, you know, stay in shape and everything. And, and and at home, at his own house, he had a swimming pool and he swam every day for exercise. The White House swimming pool had been filled in under in the Nixon uh, era to be the new press room. It was an indoor pool there. So President Ford uh, really wanted to have a pool, and so they did a fundraising effort, raised private money to put a pool in at the White House. The person who headed the fundraising effort for the White House swimming pool was Bill Schooling, the you know, person standing right next to him in this picture. Again, the, the connections you make in, uh, early in your life, and sometimes <laughs> uh, Maintained for years. Um, of course, President Ford is associated with football. He played high school football uh, right here, the fifth person in this row. Here. And they had a, a very successful season uh, his senior year in high school. Uh, this program here is for the Union's uh, Grand Rapids Union High School, Grand Rapids South High School football game at the end of the season is actually played on Thanksgiving Day. And it was supposed to settle, I mean, these were two undefeated teams, supposed to settle the, the city championship or even the mythical state championship. They didn't have playoffs in, in that era. And what happened? Well, this cartoon down here shows you what conditions. Uh, it had a blizzard. You couldn't even see, the people in the stands couldn't really even see what was going on on the field. Uh, the game ended up nothing, nothing tie. No, no score. But a few weeks later, it was determined that Union High School used an ineligible player game was forfeited. So the, the team from South always considered themselves to be the city champions and state champions. For pretty much the rest of their lives, they got together every year around Thanksgiving time uh, for, you know, to sort of celebrate what they had accomplished and keep up context, you know, the friends and that sort of thing. In 1975, their gathering was held at the White House. And again, he was, you know, still loyal to all of his uh, friends, even from a young age there. And you can see here, this is the one time he did sign his full name uh, on my dad's yearbook. See some of the activities. Again, they're graduating in the midst of the depression. Uh, you know, these President Ford's father owned a small paint company. Uh, any business in the depression, it's tough to keep things going. But, but you know, at least. He wasn't out of work or anything like that. He had some, they had money coming in. In my father's case there, this is my grandfather uh, in his uh, A&P store in Grand Rapids. Uh, 
He, um, and never had problems with getting food on the table <laughs> in that time period there on, the, on a grocery store. Although he later moved on out to a small town outside of Grand Rapids, uh, but he ran the general store there, and so, and that was. And, and President Ford is known for his association with, with Michigan football, although he didn't really play all that much. Again, freshmen were not eligible. Sophomore and junior years, he was playing behind an All-American. He was, he was a center. Again, this is in the time period when players went both ways. He was a center on offense and a linebacker on defense. Uh, because he was behind an All-American, he basically got mop-up time at the end of the game. Uh, uh, in the games. Uh, but then in his senior year, he was named the most valuable player, although it was on a team that didn't have a whole lot of success. So uh, he always you know, joked about that. But just, um, but he, he was an e econ major, uh, did very well academically. His goal in life was to become a, an attorney, uh, but the only reason he was able to go to college at all, this was a uh, a little bit of scholarship help from uh, a fund at, at the high school. Um, again, in those days, you didn't get a full ride scholarship to play football. You, uh, the coach had a part time job. Uh, he was, you know, working, you know, cleaning dishes and in, in, in the cafeterias and things like, like that in order to, to get through school. But he. When he when he graduated and after his senior year, he was asked invited to play in a couple of All Star games. Uh, he was offered a um, contracts by the Detroit Lions, the Green Bay Packers. Uh, but in those days, pro football didn't pay all that well, like. $110 a game or something like that, you know. So, um, so what he did, he, he went on and um, his coach arranged for him to get a job as an assistant football coach at Yale University. His assistant football coach and head boxing coach uh, at, at, at Yale. And then he, t he took some classes uh, at, at the, took some summer classes at the Michigan uh, Law School and in North Carolina, and uh, there was enough to get him admitted into Yale Law School. Uh, uh, still working full time, but in and, 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 you know, law school. Uh, the other picture over here is in. Um, eating club that he belonged to there at Yale. Again, you've got, you know, future U.S. Senators, uh, Supreme Court Justice, you know, uh, 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 you know, met a, a lot of people who crossed paths later in his career. Uh, I think even, even when he was a football coach there, he coached a couple of future U.S. Senators. Um, And uh, so he came out of law school, uh, went back to Grand Rapids, established a practice, and a few months later he was in the Navy. So he didn't, didn't practice law all that long at that, at, at that point in time. Uh, he yeah, taught at the Naval Pre-Flight School in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. He was lieutenant on an aircraft carrier, aircraft carrier Monterey in the Pacific Theater, navigation officer, gunnery officer, but also organized activities to keep the crew in shape. This 
picture in the center here uh, is one. The National Archives included that picture in an exhibit that they did, which later then got into a book. They just liked it as a good picture of how, you know, some of the sailors kept in shape. They, they lowered one of the elevators that was used to raise planes up onto the deck of the aircraft carrier down here and made it into a basketball court. And so you see these people playing, playing basketball here. What the National Archives didn't recognize when they, they put that exhibit together is that this man right here jumping, doing the jump ball was Gerald Ford. Uh, our uh, photo archivist uh, found, you know, this picture in the, in the, among the Ford photographs, and uh, was able to then pass on the identification to the people at the National Archives who didn't didn't realize what they had there. And this is, again, I uh, mentioned, I mean, when you're president, all your family photographs become a resource. I mean, I'm sure everybody here has, has a stash of family photographs at home. Uh, they may not be very well organized. They may be scattered in a variety of different locations. But when you get to be president, all your family photographs get turned over to an audiovisual archivist, uh, gets them all organized, it creates databases to index uh, so they can, everything can be retrieved immediately. And uh, 1948 here, uh, President Ford uh, and Betty Loomer Warren got married, and that's them with the two, two sets of parents right there. And also he was running uh, for Congress by this time. Uh, in West Michigan, in this era, you can see you know, talking about the Republican primary, September 14th. The Republican primary basically was, was what was Im important. Uh, no, no Democrat would win that district until many, you know, several decades later. And so he, he ran against an incumbent, uh, uh, who had held the seat for, for six years, uh, won the primary convincingly, and uh, went off to Washington. And just quick information here about the, you know, what he did in, in, in Congress. He started, work, you know, got a good uh, assignment, committee assignment early on, became an expert in defense spending, intelligence matters, uh, space exploration, uh, moved up in the leadership already uh, served on the Warren Commission to investigate the Kennedy assassination. And in 1964, the Michigan Historical Collections, the predecessor of the Bentley Library, uh, approached him about donating his papers. Uh, first shipment arrived in early 1965, and annual batches followed. And uh, Tom Powers, sitting here in the audience today, and I uh, uh, had to get, you know, accept those at different times and uh, organize them, list them on listings, but we didn't process any of the collection at that time because it wasn't going to be open until after he re retired from office. And uh, then moved up to minority leader. Uh, 
He and Congressman Hale Boggs are the first House members to visit China after it was opened up in 1972. And, uh, you know, he had various other opportunities, but his career goal was to become Speaker of the House of Representatives, something he never, never achieved. But he was out on the road you know, 200 nights of the year delivering speeches and campaigning for Republican House candidates trying to achieve this, this goal. I included this picture not because specifically any of the people in, in it, but President Ford used this uh, trailer to camp, move around the district and, and you know, as, as a a mobile office go around the district and and meet with constituents and I actually remember uh, going with my father down to uh, 8th Street in Holland Michigan and uh, meeting with President Congressman Ford uh, back in the, you know, when I was 10 years old whatever. And then, the, you know, the Fords, uh, this is uh, with their four uh, children, uh, Mike, Jack, Steve, and Susan. But then, you know, as he's moving up in the leadership position, these, uh, I mean, a lot of interactions with uh, uh, the presidents of the time period there, uh, Lyndon Johnson, Rich, Richard Nixon. Uh, so he's had a, you know, a lot of good training for what, what later happened. You come to uh, Spiro Agnew, uh, Vice President Spiro Agnew resigned. Uh, and under the 25th Amendment, President Nixon was allowed to uh, appoint a successor uh, and nominated Gerald Ford to fill this position, somebody who was acceptable to both Republicans and Democrats. And again, this was a different era of politics. Republicans and Democrats could disagree on issues and still be friends. Uh, outside of work, uh, you know, he, even as president, uh, Ford uh, could, uh, you know, battle with Congress all through the week and then go out golfing with the, speak, the Democratic Speaker of the House uh, on, on Sunday. You know, so, um, again, he was, uh, confirmed by both houses, uh, overwhelmingly by both houses of Congress. But, or when Ford was nominated as vice president, and I was, by this time, I was, I was working at, at the Bentley Library, and our director, Robert Warner, uh, that this was on a on a Friday that Ford was evening that Ford was nominated uh, to be vice president. Uh, Dr. Warner was up at his cottage in Harbor Springs, Michigan. The uh, and so he, he uh, when he found out about this, the Ford papers were stored off-site. They were not in the library. They were in the off-site storage. And he thought it was important to get them as soon as possible into the library. And so he started calling university people, trying to get a hold of somebody to arrange to have the collection moved. And he called various lower-level officials, couldn't get a hold of anybody. They were for the evening, ended up running out of change, calling university president Robin Fleming, collect. 
and uh, and, uh, and 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 President Fleming, sort of guessing what was what this was about, accepted the charges and uh, and were able to arrange to have the collection moved into the Bentley Library uh, just uh, uh, within the next couple of days. But then. Um, May 4th, uh, 1974, uh, you know, this is after uh, he's been confirmed as vice president and uh, he comes back to Ann Arbor to deliver the commencement address. But more importantly for me, or for our story here, uh, he also visited the Bentley Library on that day. And so this is and President Ford and Dr. Warner and and uh, President Fleming, uh, looking at uh, parts of the, the Ford papers and touring through the building, and and here he is. That's yeah, yeah. Uh, that's me and the Senator there shaking hands with President Ford. The other picture over there. Uh, my father found out that Ford was going to be there. He was, he was standing outside, shook hands with, with President Ford and chatted for a few minutes. Uh, and was, but uh, their former connections and uh, high school and everything. But the vice presidency, it was a, a very short period. There was uh, 10 months that he was vice president and uh, Richard Nixon resigned and sworn in as uh, as president. And uh, the keys here, this line about following the ceremony, President Ford went immediately to work. No transition, anything like that. Uh, when um, normally, when a president gets elected, they've got time to plan, to, uh, you know, decide who all of their assistants are going to be, to and uh, appoint members of the cabinet. Uh, again, President Ford just had to proceed with, with staff that was there, uh, the few supplemented by the few uh, from his own vice presidential staff, uh, and, and work with the, the cabinet President Nixon had created until you know such time as, as the uh, some of these people left and uh, others can be appointed in their place. But he didn't have any time to uh, just had to jump right in, start making decisions, and, uh, and then he uh, appointed. Uh, Nelson Rockefeller is his vice president, and uh, a few weeks later, uh, pardoned President Nixon. And this is, um, I'm not going to read this one, but again, this, this summarizes some of the things that were going on in that time period. Uh, and. Or presidency had to, had to face. November nineteen seventy four. President we we were supposed to go down to Washington to pick up some additional Ford papers uh, in early August of 1974. That got canceled when when the transition uh, took place. But in November 1974, uh, Dr. Warner and I and uh, Tom Jones, who later was executive director of the Historical Society of Michigan, uh, 
went down there to pick up materials. So how do you pick up materials from the White House? You, you rent a U-Haul truck. Uh, again, it was all, all loaded for us by people, people down there. These were materials that were stored in the exe executive office building, the building right next to the White House there. But if you, if you look very closely here, we loaded the thing, materials on one day. We picked up the truck and drove it back to Ann Arbor the next day. Well, here's, here's our U-Haul truck uh, back there on the uh, this oval driveway just to the south of the White House. Uh, so in the morning, that's sort of a one-way driveway, we had to circle right around by the, the south door of the White House there in, in order to get out and uh, drive the drive back to, back to uh, Ann Arbor. Or the rest of the staff at the library gathered to uh, help unload. And these are just sample pictures of, of President Ford at, at work in the White House. This picture on the left is uh, the, one of the discussions about the, the, the cl closing weeks of the Vietnam War. Uh, Graham Martin, the ambassador uh, to South Vietnam, uh, General Frederick Wyand, who had been sent over there to uh, check things out and report back, and, uh, and Henry Kissinger, Secretary of State. And you can see here in the middle picture, uh, again, Liberty often wandered in on meetings and all that. Uh, I don't know that she was ever specifically given a security clearance or anything, but uh, uh, she often participated in meetings, and this is uh, Henry Kissinger and, and uh, National Security Advisor Brent Scowcroft, who was the president. And then over on the right, you have uh, Donald Rumsfeld and Dick Cheney meeting with President Ford, and they were part of his staff then, and then uh, later went on to, to positions in, in other presidencies. And, you know, President does meet, meet with foreign leaders, and here you have him signing an agreement, an arms control agreement with uh, Brezhnev for the Soviet Union, meeting with Chairman Mao and, in China, and social occasions too. And, and President Ford was president during the nation's 200th birthday. A lot of foreign leaders came to visit the U.S. here. Always had to have some form of state dinner, and uh, so there's some some dancing and fancy meals. Being president, also, but uh, there's there's at least a little bit of time for relaxation. This first picture actually, again, a, a sudden transition like that. All of the Nixon's personal belongings were still in the in the quarters. The family quarters. There, the, at this point, was no no official residence for the vice president. So the Fords uh, had been living all along in their in the house that they had owned uh, since the 1950s in uh, Arlington, Virginia. And even for the first say 10 days of the, of the Ford presidency, he basically get in the car and be driven to the White House to go to work. But when he got up in the morning, he didn't have, you know, the White House mess, uh, the White House chef preparing meals for him or anything like that. So he'd come down to, to the kitchen there and toast his English muffins and, uh, but you don't, 
you, you sort of lose a little bit of privacy when, when the news media has to come in and take pictures of you uh, doing so. Even after they got to the White House, you see President uh, Ford there and his daughter Susan, they're out playing tennis on the tennis courts, trying to get, you know, and it's a relaxation. Oh, you got a phone right there by the tennis court. You can't get away from, from the work. Uh, and a lot of, a lot of, you know, visitors had come into the White House. Also, uh, President Ford's son, Jack, arranged for uh, George Harrison and Billy Preston to come into the White House. And so here's President Ford meeting uh, a couple of younger icons from that, that time period. And uh, one of my early things there mentioned about the, the 1976 campaign. These were the first televised campaign debates since the, the uh, Nixon-Kennedy ones in 1960. The intervening years had not debates so reestablishing this, this tradition. So uh, President Ford lost the 1976 election. Uh, what happens then? They load all the materials, uh, all the all the papers. They're boxed up out of the filing cabinets, loaded onto trucks, strapped on pallets, loaded onto trucks. And the first of those trucks was here in Ann Arbor before midnight of, the, of inauguration day. And. Subsequently, there was what, 11 or 12 semis of materials that came to Ann Arbor. Uh, this picture on the right is in the temporary quarters that we had uh, down in the plant department buildings uh, near, near the football stadium. And uh, you can see, again, some of the stuff on, on pallets there. When we first started, it was all on pallets like that. We had a master list that told us, OK, the boxes from such and such an office are on pallet 364. We had a, a map that said pallet 364 is located in this location. In order to provide reference service, we go out with our tin snips, cut the strapping on the pallets, pull the boxes off, and you know, go through in order to find the documents. Uh, it got a lot more efficient once we were able to put some shelving up, but it was a, a slow process there of clear some space, put up some shelving, find the boxes that go on there, consolidate the rest of the space down, and you know. And we had, uh, and the, uh, also uh, crowding us there, we had all of the, the objects, the uh, gifts that they'd received and that sort of thing, that were going to go to the Ford Museum in Grand Rapids. All of those were right there also. And so we had to be uh, museum people for a period of time, too, until, until the Ford Museum was completed. And President Ford uh, would come back to campus uh, to, to visit. He um, lectured to some classes. The picture on the left is him uh, talking to a political science class in uh, 1977. He came over to our temporary quarters to meet with us. And, uh, and he's, he, there's a picture on the right. He's out on North Campus at the site where the Ford Library now stands, uh, again, uh, with Dr. Warner and President Fleming. And they're looking at the building plans and sort of picturing how the building was going to look when it was built. Uh, but one, one thing 
the resident board always said when we then uh, our director would talk to him about oh you know when should we schedule this event and that sort of thing. He always wanted to come in the fall. Gave him an opportunity to go down and meet with the football team, uh, and talk to the players and that sort of thing. So if uh, President Ford and Bo Schembechler they're uh, talking to the team and uh, a few years later here, here they are with Anthony Carter. 1979, cornerstone laying for the building. President Ford and cornerstone. Again, there was the building wasn't complete enough to be able to then do any sort of reception or anything there. So we go next door to the Bentley Library for for the uh, reception. The Bentley staff had put together an ex exhibit about the Ford Papers. And the person who put the exhibit, planned the exhibit, was my wife, Marilyn. Right there, so another family connection. Uh, 1981, 50th reunion class of South High School. And you've got, it's not it's easy to pick out there, but this President Ford's here, my dad. Up there. And he'd always, you know, wanted to take pictures with the staff whenever he visited. So we have a lot of different pictures of him with the uh, staff of the Ford Library. And actually, uh, the uh, Jenny Sterneman, second from right in the seat in the front row. I just had dinner with her out in California within the last few weeks. But all, all, the, all the rest of these folks are retired now. The Fords came, the whole Ford family came back for the uh, football jersey retirement ceremony at Michigan Stadium, 1994. This, I believe, was the last of President Ford's visits to the library and museum. This is in Grand Rapids, uh, July 2003, at the time of his 90th birthday celebration. Um, he was looking pretty frail, but when he got up there and started talking to the to the crowd uh, out, outside, uh, the voice you know firmed right up, and he you know was able to. Uh, speak, it sounded just like he had years before. But, uh, but that, uh, after he was 90, uh, the doctors recommended that he not cut back on his travel. So we didn't really see him uh, in the next few years. And uh, Okay, actually, if we step back here a few days prior to this, usually I uh, didn't take off all that much time around the holidays. Uh, December uh, of 2006, I said, I'm going to take off the whole holiday period. Uh, December 26th, uh, our Family on our way, we came home from having uh, gone to uh, the Fisher Theater in Detroit, uh, and the phone rang. News that Pre President Ford had died. Well, uh, my I, at that time I had responsibilities with the with the website. I had to go in. Uh, and change the, the, the front page of the website and announce President Ford's death and uh, put up information about what was going to happen in terms of the funeral. So, uh, and then go into work the next day and work like 16 hours. So that was, that was my vacation. Uh, uh, 
but uh, we had some uh, There were th things that, you know, specifically tied into the library and museum. Of course, uh, President Ford is buried at the museum in Grand Rapids. Uh, when uh, some of the staff from Ann Arbor is allowed to go over for this ceremony on the left here, and the, when uh, there, were, there were funerals uh, or ceremonies held, there was one in California where he lived then he lay in state in Washington, and then the body was flown to Grand Rapids for burial. When, when Air Force One in, in uh, carrying the body, he specifically flew low in Ann Arbor, right in over the, the Ford Library and Michigan Stadium. Then they went on to Grand Rapids for this, this ceremony here. Uh, and then uh, they had uh, a day when 24 hours when the museum was open and people could come in and pay their last respects. Uh, I think it was something like 60,000 people went through the museum in 24 hours. And that's you can see them lined out, lined up from the doors all the way across the bridge, across the river there. And uh, I just threw in some suggestions for further reading if you want to learn more about President Ford. Of course, down at the bullet point at the bottom, uh, visit the library, visit the museum. We've got lots of displays, or if you want to do your own research, uh, you can sign up as a researcher at the Ford Library and look at some of the original documents, or, or go to the website and look at the, some of the ones that have been digitized. And uh, a special, couple of special thanks to uh, archivists who assisted me in uh, finding a couple of, I had a number of things that I, specific items that I wanted to find and uh, needed a little help along the way. I've been out of, I, I retired in 2013 and so uh, I have to rely on the uh, current people to some assistance too. All right. Can we say thank you to Bill for a great talk today? Thanks very much for coming. This program was recorded on March 17th, 2019 at the Ann Arbor District Library.